Okay, we'll officially make a start for in-person event. So first of all, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second Kubernetes Australia meetup here for May 2023. So whether you're joining us again from April last month or first time, very well, welcome to you all. And for the online and also later um, recording watches, welcome to this Kubernetes meetup. Just a short introduction. So this event and we originally began in Singapore, the Kubernetes Singapore meetup was begun by Young Kam, my father. And you can see a little bit about him here. He is recently became a cloud native compute computing foundation ambassador as well as all these other links and a bit about myself. I'm currently studying commerce and computer science at Monash University. I'm very happy to be able to join you here and help organize these marvelous events and see our growing community. So before I begin with tonight, I'd just like to make a short acknowledgement of country. Kubernetes Australia respectively uh, acknowledges the traditional land of the Kulin Nation on which we gather tonight and acknowledge and pay respects to the leaders past, present and emerging. So here is just our page to both Kubernetes Australia and Singapore meetup links. Here you will find upcoming events as well as the topics for and the information and also recordings. We will always have an active group chat as well. So if you're interested, please feel free to share with your friends and encourage them, encourage them to attend either the online ones or in person possible. And a massive thank you to our sponsors always, particularly Red Hat for the generous contribution of our venue tonight. The food and drinks, our awesome swag, which you get a chance to grab on the way out later tonight. And Cloud Casa by Catalogic, as well as JFrog and many more, and hopefully future sponsors. And here we have our volunteers who have graciously given their time and effort. So I uh, just pass on to uh, tonight. We have um, Susan who just joining us for the first time, and Prasanna is downstairs. He'll join us shortly. He was actually came to our first meetup last month, and today he's already helping us. So we're um, really grateful, and we're always welcome to new volunteers in any way possible. So with that, I'll just pass on to my father talk more about tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Louisa. Again, thanks everybody for joining us to learn Kubernetes. And uh, I'm super excited to be here. Actually, before uh, last week, I just came back from the Kubicon event. Did anyone not know what Kubicon is? Anyone doesn't know Kubicon. So Kubicon basically that's the largest uh, Kubernetes uh, or cloud native event in the world. So they are running basically three times every year. So the first one is in Europe and the second one this time, last two years, it wasn't running in China. But this year, September, we're going to have the Kubicon in China again. And then uh, I think that's November in North America. So that's the largest cloud native event. So it could co organize that together. They talk about Kubica kind of cloud native con. It's a together. So it's the biggest event. I never been there. This is my first time I went to Europe. I went to the Amsterdam. I enjoyed the learning. I actually didn't learn much from the sessions. I spent more time actually helping the booth duties from Cloud Casa. That's the company they sponsored me to travel to uh, Europe. So it's a very much, you know, love the trip. And uh, why I become a DNCF ambassador? I did nothing then I was running the Kubernetes meetup. So basically a few months ago, I was started uh, last September, uh, last July, I started the Kesuga Singapore meetup. And then 
only probably after three months, I applied. And uh, I was so lucky. I was selected as one of the 154 DNCF ambassadors globally. Okay. I'm actually the only one and the first one in Singapore. So, so excited to be here to share what, what I learned. I'm pa very passionate about Kubernetes. Did you guys say I'm a fully certified on Kubernetes? <laughs> <laughs> I also love multi-cloud. I love all different cloud. And uh, all of this, I love OpenShift. I love Red Hat. So to help us to continue to run the meetup, to help more people to learn Kubernetes, I do need, these are the three challenges, a few challenges. So I need more volunteers to help me. So right now, my uh, Kesuga Singapore, Actually, I got 15 volunteers to help me. So even I'm traveling, I'm not there. I got the guys that can continue to run so the people can continue to learn. The same thing, I'm trying to, to build the volunteers, the volunteer team here in uh, Melbourne before we expand to Sydney. But we are ahead of Sydney, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the first link is about volunteers. And the second link, I also constantly looking for sponsors. I don't want you you guys come here to learn and uh, you're hungry. Okay, I need a sponsor for the food, drinks and the swags. So that's the second one. If your company or you know any company are willing to sponsor, let, let us know or ask them to fill out the form. The last one is uh, we're also constantly looking for the speakers. That's the last time I mentioned, you don't want to every time say me, I'm talking. I got lots of topics I can continue to run, but you might be boring to see me every time I was talking, okay? So yeah, thank you guys. Help us to expand to looking for more volunteers, more sponsors, more speakers. So we can, more, we can learn more interesting stuff around Kubernetes. So last time, I don't know how many people are first time here. Wow, amazing. I love it. So one of the stuff we talked about last time is the CNCF uh, uh, landscape. Do you guys know the CNCF landscape? If you go to i, that's interactive, i.cncf.com, you will see there are so many different companies uh, part of the CNCF ecosystem. Lots of stuff to learn. Yeah. This is the one from the last time, our first meetup here. Okay. And uh, you see a lot of people enjoyed the learning, the social and the food is also not, not too bad. And the plus the, the swag as you can take away. So very good. Well, we're trying to continue to continue to run. I don't want to miss any months. Uh, that's my goal. I want to make it a minimum of once every month. For my Singapore team, I actually now running more than once every month. Because I got to fix the location from Google and the plus additional one, so I can easily to manage. Right now here, I actually I'm struggling to find a fixed place, uh, but I'm still targeting to run once in in June, and will continue to run once every every month. So if you are interested, so all of my recordings, including the Singapore one, uh, Singapore we already did uh, 10, 10 times already. And uh, it's all the recordings from all this URL. So today's topic, so we got, last time we talked about the uh, AWS. So Red Hat OpenShift, they have the services on AWS called Rosa. This time I'm a multi-cloud guy. I don't want to just stuck with AWS. This time we are going to focus on Microsoft Azure or Azure or whatever you, you like the name. And the first one, we're going to talk about Azure AKS. So how do you spin up an AKS cluster? Uh, that's uh, my, my topic. I'm actually, I try to get more people to learn. I kind of like force my daughter to do this session. <laughs> uh, don't be stressed. The second one, and uh, I will pass to Paul, Paul Foster from Red Hat to talk about uh, Arrow. So Arrow, it's uh, Azure Red Hat OpenShift. It's managed the OpenShift service on uh, Microsoft Azure platform. So it's one of the great platform. And then after that, so we talk about the AKS, we talk about Arrow, and then I will spend some time to talk about uh, the day-to-day -day management. So, it, 
you deploy AKS cluster, you only take a couple of minutes. You deploy Arrow also like a 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then you still need a backup. You still need to think about the DR, how to get to the DR working, how to do the migration. I was running from an AKS, I just give an example, or it could be from a, uh, AWS EKS, or it could be any on-premises, uh, the Kubernetes, uh, you build your own Kubernetes. You want to move to Arrow, or maybe you want to move to other platform also works. So I just give you some idea how to do the container backup DR, how to do the migration across all different Kubernetes platform. Since we are talking about AKS, I will try to show you how to migrate from AKS to Arrow, okay? And the last but not least, we will have an open mic time. Uh, last time we are run, we are rush. We don't have time to do the open mic, or uh, and we also do the photo. Yeah, take a group of photo, help us to to promote. Yeah, and uh, a little bit more social time. Hopefully, we can have some more drinks. And uh, any questions? Uh, feel free to interrupt to ask. Does that sound good? Cool. This is an open mic time towards the end. We will come back to this slide. So basically the idea is, I, this is a one I learned from other meetup. I joined some other meetup, which is completely not, not relevant to me. I don't know. Uh, last time I joined something like uh, Angular. I, I, I got no idea at all what Angular is used for. But I just went to that meetup to learn how these guys are running the meetup. So one thing I learned is they, they do the open mic time. So you might be looking for a job, or you might want to hire someone. So it's a great opportunity, or you might just want to introduce yourself to the team. Uh, before I move to the first topic, I just to highlight uh, there are a few upcoming meetup or events. Uh, from Red Hat side, there is a, a deep dive session uh, talking about the Arrow, the workshop. And uh, that one was from uh, 9th May. And then followed by 10th May, I listed here, that's a form of my Kubernetes Singapore meetup. Uh, for you guys, if you guys are interested, you can join uh, remotely. You can join online. The timing, it's, it's not too bad, starting seven, seven, seven o'clock, uh, that will be our 9 p.m. And then we got to the 11th, 11th, we got to the Rosa workshop. How many hours? Four. Typically a few hours, right? Half day, yeah, half day. It's a very good learning. So basically you learn from the beginning how to create a cluster, how to deploy applications. Yeah, yeah, that's really a good one. And then I also include another one that's uh, 24th May. I just look into the meetup.com. What's the next meetup I just include in here in case you, any one of you guys are interested. Uh, that one is a Melbourne SRE meetup. And I mentioned earlier, June, I'm planning to run another one, but I haven't confirmed the location yet. But hopefully uh, not too far away, I can confirm the, the place. I will share the slides, but if you guys want to take a screenshot, yeah, go for it. So that's the workshop from our Red Hat. So one is uh, Arrow, the other one is uh, a Rosa uh, workshop. But I will share the slide deck to you guys uh, anyway after after the meetup. Hmm. Yeah, good. Is it okay? All good. Cool. Anyone is using Valero? Come on, that's the number one open source free backup tool for Kubernetes. Yeah, if you haven't tried, give it a try. But if you are already using the Valero. Uh, this guy, uh, Cloud Casa. Sorry, I have to mention Cloud Casa. The guy that sponsored me traveled to Europe. <laughs> if you're using Valero, you will realize uh, Valero is a Kamala and tool. It's a number one very powerful engine to do the Kubernetes backup. But there is also some some uh, some restrictions. Uh, for example, you don't have the nice UI. It's fully Kamala and driven and you don't have much more visibility, you don't have a multi-class management, the built-in security, et cetera. So Cloud Casa actually built something special for Valero. So if, if you're already using Valero, it's a great opportunity to grab the $50 gift card. I can share you the details yeah, if you're interested. But for anyone else, if you are using 
Kubernetes, you should give it a try the backup, the value, it's free. Why not? As long as you give, you give it a try, you add two clusters, you can get a $50 gift card as well. That's based on what I hold from the company, yeah. I think that's all about the introduction. Uh, I want to move to the second uh, second topic. Yeah, any questions uh, while we're switching this to a different slide? Any question? Oh, by the way, anyone want to do Kubernetes uh, certification? There is a there is a special code right now that you can get a 50, uh, 40 40 percent discount. Uh, 50, you, you got a 50. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, serious. If anyone wants to do any Kubernetes uh, certification, CKA, CKA, DCKS, or KCNA, right now there is a, that's after we attended the Kubicon event, is sent to everyone, there is a code, but that code will expire. I think that's tomorrow. Yeah, if you guys are interested, no, it's not me set, okay? It's the Kubicon organizer, they set the timeline. If you want to do the, get the 40% discount code, you need to make it happen before it expire. Oh, I'm, of course, you can, fifth of May. Oh, okay, my mistake. Yeah, yeah. You need a book, and uh, I believe you can re, you know, reschedule as well. So yeah, uh, I will share the the code. Mm. Okay. So the first topic we're going to do is a uh, AKS cluster. So let's see how you can just run one command to create an AKS cluster in about five minutes. We're using the latest one, that's 1.26. Before that, I want to highlight I'm 11 times, actually 65. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, yeah, I just keep learning. Yeah, I keep doing the learning stuff. Okay, let me, let me pass to my daughter, Luisa, to continue. Don't worry about you know. It, it is actually yes. created the automation. It's a it is yeah, so it's very much step by step. Um, we're just gonna follow a few really three steps or something from today we already prepared the github repository in order to deploy um run up that spin out that cluster so using the aks and this is version 1.26 it's quite recent update okay. okay. So in this live demo, it will take up to five minutes to sign up, which well, really less than, but sign up this trial account. You can just follow this link. And using one command, you can build this ready to use lab and it only take around five minutes. The previous trials, it took around four minutes, 12 to 15 seconds. And the actual destruction of your whole lab, including that AKS cluster, actually takes a bit longer, up to 10 minutes. And currently you can know, you probably all know that AKS is actually the third major card offering. So after of course, EKS and GKE, again, mentioning Cloudcaster, they are actually um, compatible. But I've just got to... Okay. So in order to prepare for this, we'll just open Cloud Shell from the Zero portal and really simple, 
just to clone the repository from the GitHub here. So I actually made another branch from Yong Khan's original repository. Then the, okay. So let's head over to, So you can see the cloud shower is up and ready already, already. And oops. just move the tab. Okay, thank you. So navigate over to the GitHub and from the top here, this is just one of the many repositories and it's all public. So feel free to access that. We can go straight to the readme. And here there is a brief description as well as a video on how to sign up for the trial account. And we're up to the prerequisite already. So now that we've got the cloud shower open, all we need is to copy and paste this command over. And since this already exists, we can move on to spinning up the actual cluster. So head down to the automation section. So again, just to copy that command in order to deploy the AKS cluster. And as this says, it should only take around five minutes. was on mute sorry sorry guys it was on mute now should be should be good and are we still recording yes yeah to to your question you don't really need water you create a create a trial account you can try 30 days you give you like a 200 dollars that's more than enough i never run out of the trial account yeah i never run out of the trial trial uh, credits. Yeah. Let me open up the I think uh, that's the one I think that's this one. Yeah, so basically we, we already created the AKS cluster and the how to create we clone the repository and then we run this command to deploy. And once once you've done your testing, make sure you, you remember to destroy it. Otherwise, it will keep keeps running, keeps charging you. Yeah. Uh, that's about it, about the AKS cluster automation. Any other questions about this topic? Absolutely. 
Personally, I think that's a game changer because I agree. You know, if you're if you're a dev, you're spinning out clusters. You know, destroying them all the time can be a bit of pain, right? So if you can just spin it up, deploy your workload, and then hibernate it, uh, and then you're not paying for that, that compute. You know, for me, it makes it certainly makes the OpenShift managed offerings quite competitive. Will the high energy low cost on those costs? I believe it's well. There's two things coming, and we talked about this last last time for those that were here. Um, OpenShift in the cloud is moving to a new control plane model, which is Kubernetes clusters managing many control planes. So we're moving away from a model where you have a dedicated set of worker nodes for control plane. We're moving them onto a Kubernetes cluster, and, they, and we're taking all the things that make up OpenShift. There's probably another thirty other bits and pieces that are going to go into that single namespace on a shared cluster. Um, and, and then you're going to pay for the control plane similar to an EKS payment, which is like 10 cents an hour or whatever, right? So it won't be no cost. There'll be, still be a control plane cost, but you'll have zero nodes. Yeah, so you're not paying for any of the work nodes. Just mini trips. So that's the fact that we did that. Yeah, that's yeah, it's, 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 it's a good it's a good style as well. You can run open shift as well. Yeah, cover the workspace as well. Yeah, there's there's different things. Um, yeah, there's there's different styles being thrown to me. It depends on what sort of organization you're working. With. You know, if you're an organization where if you're working at a bank, you know. You know, you're probably developing in the cloud, right? If you're working at a small, smaller company that's a bit more cost conservative, yeah, you're probably developing on your own. Stephen, you said that the game is going to be interacting between the containers and the mm -hmm. database. Mm -hmm. As we go to the cloud and changing the configuration every time, I am not going to be able to do the cost of the cloud. Should be using GitOps, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about GitOps later. All right. Are you still going or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I almost done this. Yes. So. Send me that Zoom link so I can join. Z5. Share. Z5. The same one. Yeah. Uh, Z5. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So I'm going to talk about um, Arrow, which is in uh, Microsoft Azure. It's a storage power product. It's uh, in the marketplace and in Azure. It was jointly produced by Red Hat and um, Microsoft. And it's jointly supported as part of our shared responsibility model. Red Hat SREs, Microsoft SREs, jointly supporting the back end of the cluster. And then the, the consumer of the cluster just deployed their workloads. And, and even though it is their cluster and their tenants or their subscription, I deploy their workloads and manage um, you know, the things that they deploy their applications. Um, how many people here, I usually do this, it's tough for these meetups because everyone has different school space. So how many people here use Kubernetes on a daily basis? Okay. Not a lot. Okay, and um, Helm, how many people use Helm on a daily basis? Cool. Okay, so last time we were here, a month ago, um, I spent quite a bit of time talking about what the managed offering is, and I, I had a feeling that would be the, a similar audience, but there's quite a lot of new people here. So there's a, I'm going to go through about four or five slides about Arrow, what it is, uh, and the benefits of it. Um, and then I was going to dip into uh, my GitOps um, uh, demo. It's I actually ran a podcast on this demo, um, and I'm going to supply that link so you can all go away and look at it in, in anger uh, at a later date. Um, I probably won't go through the whole thing. It's quite um, hairy. It's full on, but I'll just go through the initial parts, which are the building blocks for um, GitOps, um, Helm, and and branching and merging strategies. I'm just going to talk about the basics of those things. I think that's probably going to be appropriate for you guys if you're not daily users of Kubernetes. Um, a little bit about me. My background is um, banking. I spent 20 years working at banks, largely in London. Uh, I got into Kubernetes. Uh, in 2017, working at Lloyds Bank, um, and I built out, I, I was there till 2020, and then moved back here, um, and more recently was working at Bendigo Bank and building out open banking and a few other major payment applications on, on AWS. Like my background is more EKS, to be honest, than, than OpenShift. I've only been at Red Hat for a year and learning OpenShift. Um, I do love OpenShift, though, and, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so let's get stuck into it. So this first slide is really about OpenShift. Who, who knows what OpenShift is? How many people know what OpenShift is? Yeah. Okay. A few people. So we'll just go, I'll just run through this pretty quickly, right? So OpenShift at its core is Kubernetes. Um, Red Hat is the second biggest, um, uh, developer for Kubernetes for the open source product. Um, Google is the first, they, they, they're the biggest contributor to the, pro the community project. Um, we're, we're second. Um, so it's just native Kubernetes that sits at the core of OpenShift. It is Kubernetes at the end of the day. It sits on top of um, Core OS, which is our hardened RHEL operating system um, that can sit on a cloud, a private cloud at the edge. We've got this thing called Micro Shift now. We can run Kubernetes at the edge on devices. Uh, it's sort of a cut down version of it. Um, virtual, physical, uh, you know, you can install it on bare metal. Um, but we like to describe Open, OpenShift as a turnkey application platform. Um, so it's not just Kubernetes. When we deliver an Arrow product, right, it, it comes with, you know, all the DNS, all the ingress is sorted for you. Um, the logging, the monitoring, Prometheus is all set up for you. You know, from it's, most of those day two activities are already there out of the box, right? The, the single sign-on, for example, right? All these things are nice. And, and packaged for you and all available there. Compare it, comparing it to uh, an EKS or an AKS, um, AKS, they're, they're pretty much raw Kubernetes, right? They do do some of this layer that we've got up on screen at the moment. They, they, AKS does deliver some DNS and a few bits and pieces, but it's certainly not what um, OpenShift delivers, right? One of the big things OpenShift delivers is also a UI and a lot of those other products they don't have that UI interface um, to, to go and manage your, your Kubernetes cluster and, and the things that you're deploying to it. Not that I would ever recommend deploying anything through a UI, but I do think it's um, a, a really big productivity boost for people starting out in Kubernetes. Um, it it may, helps them see, you know, if, if you're doing a bit of the command line stuff, 
and then you've got the visual of the the UI. I think it's it's quite a powerful combination. I certainly use the UI when I am initially setting up the cluster when I first learning OpenShift. Right. So when I'm when I want to learn something, I, I'm click opsing it. I, I you know, maybe I'm deploying Argo CD for the first time. So I click ops it. I I play around, tinker with the configuration, and then maybe after that I'll wrap it in a Helm chart or the YAML that came out of it, and then I'll git ops it from that point onwards and deploy it properly in a in a proper fashion at a, as you would at a bank or or a major organization. Um, so yeah, there's lots of good stuff in there. On top of that, there is another layer, um, which is which is the operator catalog, right? And uh, it, it's a really important thing that we, we have as well. Again, the XKSs, the EKS, the AKS of these worlds are sort of dabbling in this space as well with like a, a suite of uh, things that you can install on the clusters that are, that are sort of like they uh, are maybe tested for that particular cluster instance. Our catalog has 500 different operators in it. Um, some of them are community operators. Some of them are vendor operators from Splunk or, you know, major um, software providers. And then there's also community projects that we've taken and extended. You know, Argo CD is a great example. Argo CD for GitOps. We took Argo CD and, and made a product out of it called OpenShift GitOps. Same with Tecton, which is a, a pipeline technology. You know, in its raw form, it, it does deliver pipelines, but we've taken it, added that single sign-on, added the um, hardening of it and some visuals around delivering those pipelines, right? So we extend those products and they're available in that catalog to deploy. I don't want to spend too much time on this because a percentage of you guys were all here last time and they heard me talking about this last time. On this top layer, there are even more things. Some of these components are also deployed through the cat operator catalog, but they're a different pricing model. We have a, a rich suite of products that also um, allow you to manage lots of clusters, right? So regardless of what clusters an organization deploys, if, if it's OpenShift and then maybe they've got some EKS, maybe they've got some AKS as well, right? You know, we've got a product ACM that can manage all of the, your cluster types. They can all log in and then you can deploy applications to them, right? Um, uh, ACS in the middle there is our, our security, runtime security and policy security scanning. It's our, uh, this previously was a product called Stack Rocks. It's number one in the market, right? It's independently reviewed. It's a fantastic product. We, we bought them out and, and it's now called ACS. Um, again, it's a it's community project. As, as you probably know, Red Hat all about open source technology. We take community projects and extend them, right? And add vendor support. That's what we do. Um, finally, up the top there is, is our enterprise grade um, registry. You know, if you've, if you've dabbled with ECI, it's, it's, it's similar to, to any container registry, right? Do you do it in any service mesh ecosystem too? Yep. So, um, so what we have, we have a product called Mesh. It's basically Istio, right? So under the bonnet, so Mesh, it's at version 2.2 now. It's like a, a hard, again, it's a hardened version. I've done a lot of Istio stuff. And from what I can tell, they've um, they've made it easy for you to deploy multiple meshes on a cluster, right? And they've made it easier, easier for you to marry up meshes cross cluster. So it does do some things like that, which are pretty cool. Looking when I look at it, they've also hardened it, right? So uh, it's Istio, but there's a lot of network. Notice there's a lot of network policies in there, so they've hardened the control plane components. So like, again, like I said, they take these community projects and they extend them. And, you know, and they're good, good products, right? One of the best things about it, though, is you get vendor support, right? So when I when I was at the bank at Bendigo Bank, we built out EKS clusters to build out these big payment applications, and we we deployed a lot of community um, products on top, right? So we used the upstream projects for Argo CD and Istio and stuff. And, you know, it's pretty risky, right? Because you've got no vendor support. There's no one you can turn to, you know, when you're deploying those products and say, hey, this isn't working in my production environment. How do I get help? Right? The, the hyperscalers, the cloud providers aren't going to help you in that situation, right? So so in that, in that scenario, OpenShift had some really big benefits, right, of, of vendor support. Um, Anyway, we're not just going to sell sell OpenShift here. I'm just here to talk about um, Microsoft's uh, offering Arrow. Um, this slide's a good one just because it talks about the different ways that you can deploy OpenShift. Right? Last week we talked about this one on the left hand side at the top here. Um, Red Hat OpenShift on service on AWS. Um, today we're talking about the one next to it, Red Hat OpenShift um, 
which is on Azure, Azure Red Hat OpenShift, sorry. And it's called Arrow, right? Um, there's also a managed offering on IBM's cloud. I don't know, I've never logged into IBM's cloud. I don't know if anyone has. And we're hoping, I think IBM's hoping some people will log into it one day. Um, uh, Red Hat, uh, sorry, Google never came to the party with us. Right? So um, I, we had a great relationship with, uh, Zoo was actually the first one. So um, this joint product that was produced between Microsoft and Red Hat a few years ago now. And then AWS wanted to get in on that and they, we built Rosa. Um, Google has their own product, um, uh, Anthos, right? Which they're trying to make as their Google Anywhere, GKE Anywhere, right? Which is their Kubernetes Anywhere offering. They haven't really come to the party. We offer a product in Google Cloud called OpenShift Dedicated. It's not the same thing. It's not a first party product because um, it's purely managed by Red Hat at the back end, even though we support it. There's no joint support there from Google, as opposed to um, Arrow and Rosa, where it's a joint support model at the back end, you know, and, and also you get that single bill and it's all available in the marketplace. Down, down the bottom, these is the other ways that you can deploy it, right? You can deploy OpenShift on-prem. It's all the same product from, from a UI perspective, from an interface perspective, you know, um, you can deploy it on-prem, you can deploy it in the cloud, you could deploy it in the cloud and manage it yourself, right? If you wanted to deploy it in that scenario. I can't think in, in 2023, I can't think of any good reason why anyone would deploy a Kubernetes cluster and try to manage their own control plane, right? It makes no sense at all when you can, um, you, you get these 99.95 uh, uptime guarantees from the hyperscaler providers, right? So, you know, they're good products. And I certainly would recommend using them in a, in a business, right? So, Arrow customer benefits. Um, it aligns to cloud first strategy, right? And I don't know about you guys, but um, when I moved to the cloud and started working in the cloud, I vowed never to go back to on-prem. <laughs> it is so much better in there. A single API that connects all the products out there. Uh, you know, cloud, for me, cloud is amazing. Having spent most of my career on-prem in, in banks around the world, uh, it was just a disaster in general in, in most banks. Nothing talks to anything. You know, you're always trying to marry up things with, with different communications, right? You know, you go to a, a Microsoft or an Azure cloud, you know, you've got a single API where everything talks to each other. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so turnkey solution is how they describe Arrow. All these day two operations are built in. Managed control plane versus managed cluster. That one is about, you know, because you're probably thinking, hey, AKS and EKS are managed, right? And they are to an extent. They do manage the control plane for you. But Arrow and Rosa, these products are fully managed, including all the worker nodes, not just the control plane. It's it's monitored by the um, our SRE teams. And then we, like I said, we provide vendor support for everything you deploy on top of it, or assuming you're using our catalog. Right. Sort of like Fargate in, in AWS. So Fargate, is, it's a tough one, Fargate, because Fargate is, you don't manage the platform at all. Yeah. So it's even more in that basket of not self-managed, but you are very restricted in what you can do. Yeah. There are limitations of how you can operate in there. And there's none of this operator as well. So, yeah, look, the Fargate stories, look, it's, it's really about, um, you know, what, what's right for a customer. And, and one thing we should talk about here is that Microsoft and AWS, for that matter, do not see EKS and Rosa or AKS and Arrow as competing products. Right? They, they see them as separate products that offer a different experience for, the, for their customers, right? Arrow and Rosa are premium products, right? They are for organizations generally that, um, you know, have security concerned, need to manage their own cluster. Fargate, you're not managing your own clusters, right? You don't know where those worker nodes are. Who knows where they are, right? You don't know where that traffic's going, right? So managing your own cluster can be very important for, for certain customers, right? Um, so yeah, um, what else we got on here? Uh, proactive uh, support as opposed to reactive, you know, it's a different support model. Uh, um, and this next one, the next two actually are very important to me. Uh, and I, I did tell this story last time, I'll briefly go through it again. And, you know, the last bank I worked at, the last application I delivered was an application called Pay2. Um, and um, it was a gov mandated application around direct debits that they, you know, they're basically, believe it or not, everyone was still faxing direct debits to banks. <laughs> and so what they've done is they've standardized the whole thing and 
the government set up some servers and um, and a place that everyone could connect to. Basically, now when you go into a um, when you go into a uh, gym, say, and you want to join your membership up on the spot, you'll get you join up, you get a text, you can accept it. You know, the, it's all properly automated now. So that that was the the app we were delivering. Anyway, the point of the story was the guys I was working with were .NET developers, right, on Windows, and we were trying to take these two guys that developed .NET, and we we're trying to take them to um, Service Mesh, uh, EKS, you know, GitOps, you know, and these guys barely knew VI, you know. What I mean, they, I remember they were, I'd go over to their desk and they were like typing everything out, you know, typing the whole command out, and uh, you know, um, the point of the story is that uh, when I um, when I recommend to customers building clusters, you know, I like to have as much of it managed for, for them as they, it can be because good Kubernetes guys are hard to find. And um, if you've got a good Kubernetes guy, you know, do you want him upgrading your control plane or worrying about the sizing of your nodes or, you know, spending, wasting time on, on these types of activities? You know, where, where I saw value is injecting Kubernetes guys into your application teams and and um, building business value, right, and delivering business value, and that should be the goal of any of, of all this that we're talking about today. At the end of the day, it's not about the clusters; right? it is about delivering a business outcome, right. So it's an important thing to to keep in mind and and, and focus on. That was the transitioning journey successful for the business. To some extent, it was. Yeah. Look, I mean, um, I still supply, um, do a little bit of um, spend to support for them remotely through my phone. <laughs> you know, some of the SEO configurations. Uh, they came a long way. You know, they really did. Uh, so yeah, I definitely think it was that success. We launched that application on time. So yeah, I, I definitely call it a success. Yeah. What's that? Uh, not, not true, actually. So, I mean, that was on an EKS cluster, but I, I am going to talk a little bit about how I build applications. Like I said, the, the podcast link that I'll give you is actually how we built Open Banking with the previous app that we built at, at that bank. Very similar, right? And if you're using GitOps, if you're using Argo CD, yeah. it's just YAML at the end of the day, right? There are some dis uh, discrepancies between an Arrow and, a, and an EKS. Uh, but by and large, you could take exactly what we built on EKS and deploy it on um, Arrow. In fact, uh, Yong Kang is doing a demo at the end of this meetup where he's going to take an EKS cluster, back it up, and restore it on an Arrow cluster. Yeah, have all the templates for the Azure YAML file templates. Exactly. You can just do it. That's right. Exactly. Um, some of the other benefits on the screen: um, observability out of the box and integration and forwarding. We have a lot of plugins and stuff that. It's a lot of it. It's a lot of it's really easy for you, right? When I first started learning OpenShift, um, you know, I I started deploying some of these operators, and I remember doing the same thing on EKS and and how difficult it, it was actually. Uh, whereas you know you've got this vendor baked in knowledge with the operator hub on OpenShift, right? They've already pre configured everything for you, so you just deploy it and it just works, and it's got that single sign on, you know. So I found that I was very quickly up to speed with what we'd built previously at the bank, uh, just in my own um, demo quite easily. Right? Again, just another one of the benefits, right? So anyway, but um, uh, I'll move on from this because uh, I wanted to get to some of the other stuff. I don't know how we're doing for time. Okay. Um, so this will be sent out to you guys uh, after, the, after the meetup. Like I said, the podcast at the top, it's got the full 45-minute demo of how I build applications in the cloud. It's a, it's a complete look at, CICD and my approach to CICD. There are a million ways to be successful with CICD. My approach is just one of them. Um, it, it's not perfect. It's not missing. There's some, I would probably add some uh, live testing into the pipelines, which I haven't got. So this is, it's still a work in progress for me, but it's uh, it should be of interest if you're interested in CICD because uh, it's a unique sort of take on it in the sense that uh, it's a sort of solution you'd use a major organization. Okay. Um, I'll put some other links up on here um, on how to build clusters. And I'm going to have a quick look at an, an, another approach to building clusters. I know we've just seen a, a scripted one with Yong Kang. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bicep in a second. Um, um, one of my counterparts, another black belt in, in, at Red Hat, this guy called Grant, 
Um, that third link down there is his landing zone, how he builds uh, Azure landing zones and deploys arrow clusters into them. Uh, beneath that is the Microsoft accelerated landing zone. They've got uh, their own version of how to uh, build arrow clusters and um, landing zones. Um, finally, at the bottom, I'm a Terraform guy, so I've put that in there. I've never actually used Terraform on Azure. I use it on an AWS. But um, if you're interested, they, they do use Terraform. Um, they do have an option for Terraform. It's actually a generic, it's a generic Terraform module that really just interfaces to the API in the same way that Bicep is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Bicep in a second. Um, and I think I missed one at the second one up there is um, just a tutorial of how to click opposite and how to do it through the command line, which is kind of important when you're starting out and, and then you move on to the other things, right? Um, so deploying with Bicep, so has anyone, has everyone heard of Bicep? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, cool. So um, Bicep is like, it's just a, oh, let's read from, from, from I've, I've copied this from Google. So <laughs> Bicep is a domain specific language, DSL, uh, that uses declarative syntax to deploy Azure resources. So this is not just about Arrow, right? Um, in a Bicep file, you define the infrastructure you want to deploy, um, and then you can use that to repeatedly deploy infrastructure, right? In a consistent manner. manner. It's, a, it's a compete for Terraform, right? Um, their big spiel is that it's better than JSON. Um, and, and to some extent, I've, I've laughed when I read that as well. And, uh, but looking at it to some extent, um, you know, maybe they've got, a, 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 maybe they're kind of right. Like it, some of their, their files are a lot shorter. You know, JSON and Helm for that matter can get, you know, really big. Um, maybe they're right. I don't know. Um, what I might do now is just jump into my, how I build clusters or build arrow clusters with bicep. I'm just briefly going to look at this. Um, it's, it originally was um, uh, Grant's one, um, the guy that built, but he's built a new one. So this is quite a cut down version of it. Again, if someone wants to copy this, get in touch with me. I, my, my, um, all of the um, GitHub stuff in this demo, I haven't actually opened up yet to anyone. Well, I opened up privately just because I've never finished it. I keep thinking I'm going to finish it. But, um, one day I will finish it and just open it all up. But if you do want to see it, just um, ping me afterwards and I'll, I'll put your GitHub link in there. Um, so, so what does this do? So um, to, to buoy a cluster in an automated fashion uh, using Bicep, um, we need Bicep modules, right? These templates, they're called templates. Um, and all I'm going to be building is a resource group that Yong Kang talked about before. I'm going to build a network, some uh, some VNets, and then I'm going to build my arrow cluster. Okay, and like I said, they they're just files, right, with parameters that can be passed in, and then they're templating for. Um, and this one, for example, is the the Microsoft Red Hat OpenShift cluster, right? It is like I talked about with Terraform. These are generic APIs that the uh, Azure Cloud is providing. Um, they're not specific. You know, with AWS, with Terraform, you're probably familiar with um, uh, deploying specific um, resources around, I don't know, how many people here use Terraform? Oh, good. Yeah, so Terra, they have lots of different Terraform modules specific to the things they're going to deploy, right? Whereas Bicep and, um, and the Terraform modules for Azure Cloud, they're all very generic. You're just passing in to the same API and just, um, listing the name of the resource that you're going to deploy and then deploying this um, this language, this DSL markup. Um, so, so once we've got those, then we have um, some parameters that we're going to pass in here. In here, I'm just actually giving the actual name of my cluster that I want to pass in, things like that, how many worker nodes, what no, what, what else. Um, and, and then finally, these are GitHub Actions, right? I'm sure people are familiar with GitHub Actions. Yeah, you're deploying. This, this is um, GitHub's pipeline technology. I don't particularly love it. I'm using it to build the, a cluster. But once I build the cluster, I switch over to Tekton. So Tekton is um, a, a native pipeline technology um, that, it, that comes with uh, OpenShift. Um, I prefer it because I can GitOps it. You know, you've heard me talk about GitOps a bunch of times tonight. You know, I can wrap my pipelines and Helm charts and then deploy them to the cluster with, a, with an Argo CD using GitOps. So I treat my pipelines the same way I treat my applications. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's a real big benefit of Tekton. Having said that, having your pipeline technology buried inside the place where your Git is 
also has huge advantages. And I do like GitLab's and 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 I do like GitHub's, but I, I personally would never use it to to build applications. Um, right. So I've already spun off my cluster. I'll just show you here. I, I don't have any. Um, usually, if it's a production environment, I would make merge requests to this this um, repo, which would trigger my builds. Right. In this case, I'm not doing that, and I just re manually ran this um, and ran this workflow, and I created that cluster this morning. One thing I forgot to mention is that um, I also, once I create the cluster, I'll just go back and show you this. Um, uh, arrow public cluster. Once I create the VNet and create the arrow cluster, I actually connect and deploy one, uh, two Helm charts. So I, I, I know this is a terrible script and you've actually got a password here, which is horrendous, but um, I deploy two Helm charts. Again, I don't like doing any kind of connection from a, a CLCD tool to a cluster directly. I like to use Ar Argo CD and GitOps, but in the initial startup, when you um, initially build a, a subscription or an AWS account or building clusters, sometimes there's things that you probably don't want to do, but you have to do. So I'm deploying these two Helm charts. I use four loops in Helm charts in my solution to deliver uh, all my applications. I deliver payloads of applications through four loops. And I do talk about this in the, um, in the uh, podcast, if you get to it, where, um, so when I deploy one Helm chart to the cluster, if I was a bank, for example, and I had a thousand applications that were supposed to be on this cluster and it blew up, I rebuild the cluster, I deploy the one Helm chart, it deploys all my thousand applications, right? So in that scenario, um, I can show you the cluster that's, that was provisioned. This is an OpenShift cluster. Um, it's the Arrow cluster. It's no different to the Rosa cluster from, from a user perspective, right? It's no different to the cluster that's on-prem that you deploy, right? It's a single um, consistent experience between clouds or between your on-premise workspace, right? Inside, um, um, as part of one of those initial Helm charts, I deployed a bunch of infrastructure through the catalog. Um, and one of those things was Argo CD, which is OpenShift GitOps in 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 uh, OpenShift. Um, and you can link in. What, well, another thing I like about using the UI is all my links and all my tools that I've de delivered into OpenShift are available here. Right, Argo CD is a great one. So when I click on that, it launches a. Uh, I've got this thing in my face. One second. Um, uh, that that launches Argo CD. So this is the Argo CD instance. How many people are familiar with Argo CD? A couple people, good on you. I, for me, Argo CD is the number one way to deploy applications. I have tried a couple of the other GitOps tools. I don't really love them. And I certainly don't love um, uh, point in time deployments to clusters using pipelines. You know, like I said, my cluster blows up. I, I deploy a Helm chart and I bring it all back. Right? PVCs aside and um, Yong Kang can talk about um, deploying the data or backing up the data. But, you know, by and large, I can deliver all my cluster config back, right? Um, and that's the power of GitOps. You know, we're bringing that um, version control software and we're marrying up Kubernetes, both of which were massive game changers in, in the IT industry when they arrived, right? Um, where am I? Okay, so that's a little um, trip through all those things. How am I doing for time, Yong? Five more minutes. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so now is when I get into the, um, the GitOps demo. Okay. I, I pinched this, um, the, this, um, online boutique application. Google wrote it. I liked it because it had 11 microservices. It also had lots of interconnectivity between the microservices. Uh, and they actually did some Istio stuff, um, themselves. I love Istio. Um, so, uh, it was a good one for me because what I wanted to showcase is, you know, what does a major application with lots of microservices and lots of environments look like, right? And I've listed on here, the screen, uh, some of the challenges that you face with um, developing CICD solutions. Um, you know, how do you set up your repositories? Um, how do you manage environment variables? Um, you know, I need lots of different environments. How, would I, how do I manage these? Linting, code, security, scanning unit tests, integration tests, authentication, monitoring, alerting, encryption, and certificates, right? You know, this is just a list that I came up with. There's probably a lot more things that you have to 
uh, tackle when building out a proper CICD solution. We're not going to get to this in five minutes. There's another hour here. So you're going to have to watch the video if you are interested. Um, what I do talk about is, is the following things. Um, I do a brief overview of Helm. Um, I talk about what is GitOps and Argo CD, my branching and merging strategies and webhooks, so, you know, how I use them. I talk about my overall CICD solution, how I set up my repositories. You know, I use this I, with a big multi-microservice architecture. I have a single repository for each of my microservices. And then I have a separate CD repository where I do all my deployments, right? Which is what Argo CD is going to be watching. Reason I split it out is because uh, in in a bank or in a major environment, you know, we're not. It's not just about deploying containers, right? There is a lot more to applications than containers. We're talking about API gateway configurations, database schemas, right? So I split it out, and I have a CD repository where I um, manage database schemas using a tool called Liquibase, which is you know, a great tool for, um, you know, using CICD to manage a, a database schema, right? Um, so again, it's all, it's all there in the, in the video, if, if you get to watch it, of how I set these things up. Um, I might finish there because if I go on, it will, um, I need to go on and do the whole thing. <laughs> Question. All good? Oh, it's too hard? <laughs> it's easy, right? With automation, GitOps. If you guys know other questions, yeah, let's some questions up back. Yeah, I guess it depends. I mean, I think when you're talking about something like this, you've got to you've got to talk about your team set up in the same. You know, they, they, like, it's a good point, mate. Because it, like, two things go hand in hand. Right? So it, it really depends on how you um, build your teams. What I talk about in the video is about platform engineering uh, and about um, a central team managing the CICD solution and all the devs consuming it. Right? So in, in my solution. You know, the pipelines themselves would be created by the central platform team and the devs would just consume them in that sense, right? So, uh, and, you know, and also I'll talk about having a consistent approach to CICD between all your applications and between all your application development teams, right? So it's all very much about teams and how I set my teams up as well. So I talk about what, why I do, like I said, I use boards by the central helm chart, it's an initial helm chart, which is a single Argo CD application. And then I split the values file of the Helm chart into teams, right? And then I full loop through the teams and then deliver a payload of Argo CD applications per team um, and their, all their pipelines. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you, if you get a chance to watch it, uh, it, it should explain some of that stuff. But it's a good point. Um, you know, in my in my solution, the devs look after the CD as well. Uh, so, it's, it, it's, it's a joint. They, they look after all those. Any other questions? Cool. One more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like just your time with customers, like what's the, what kind of maturity are you seeing out there? Like are they scanning their help charts or like manifest files for like misconfigured cluster yeah. resources? Good question. Uh, yeah, real mixed bag. Um, I know back at the bank, we were certainly doing um, static code analysis and then we were doing runtime security, you know, with a, with a runtime team and set right and, and, and applying policies and policy scanning and then we're also scanning our images i think that's pretty common to most people since i've been at red hat i've actually learned some new stuff around um you know the big thing at the moment red hat with their DevSecOps pipeline is and uh is um signing images so they, they do a lot of that here um signing images so, and then having runtime policies that don't allow images that aren't signed the proper key signing of your of your built images that have been through your pipeline technology or your pipeline process. Um, from a customer perspective, mate, it is absolutely wild out there. You know, I've, I've been in banks all, well, and I've been totally like um, shielded from the mess, I think, because banks have so much money. And we're like, you know, compared to what, what I've seen, I, that sounds pretty nice to me now. When you go to some customer sites, I mean, they're not doing anything, mate. <laughs> they're not doing anything, mate. They're just building containers and not really doing a lot of DevSecOps. 
Yeah, I think for all the customers, it is a new concept. Yeah. Awesome. Any final question? If no other question, we will continue. So remember earlier, we talked about the AKS cluster. So we just loaned the arrow from Red Hat, which is an awesome product. So you might have noticed customer might be interested to move over from my AKS to Arrow, or could be vice versa. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. Huh? But anyway, so there is a tool. It's uh, let me share my screen. Huh? I haven't shared my screen. Give me one second. So the link to that podcast will be in the. In what Young Tang sent out, so I'll be able to stop sharing. Actually, can you stop sharing? Yeah. I think that's really Yeah. Okay. I just reshare the screen. Now it should be all good. Um, did I did I unmute to myself? Okay, all good. Yeah, let's continue. So the idea is why customer deploy containers or Kubernetes? They want to be able to build once, run anywhere. But how to go anywhere? I want to move from Microsoft Azure AKS to Arrow, for example. So you need some specialized tool to allow you to just take a backup from one cluster and then restore to another cluster. That's what I'm going to cover right now how to use the tool, just do a backup of everything. I mean, including your spec artifacts, your configurations, your PVC, your, 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 your any one of your configurations to supporting your current uh, containers running. I take a snapshot from there and then restore to another cluster. So it doesn't have to be the rose or arrow. Yeah, serious. But Red Hat, they allow you guys all move to Red Hat, okay? So let me continue here. I use uh, Azure AKS as an example. But earlier, we already did the uh, automation. We already spin up an AKS cluster. And now how to enable the AKS container backups? It's pretty simple. So all you need to do is uh, with this particular tool, Cloud Casa, it's manage the backup as a service. You don't need to manage the backup control plan at all. It's in the cloud. You just need to register your cluster to the cloud, and then you can start to create a backup policy, then define a backup. That's all we need to do. And typically, only take like a three minutes. You can enable the backups for any Kubernetes cluster. So let me show you, mm -hmm. including your persistent volume. Yes, yeah. So I'm going to log into the console. So this is a Cloud Casa Web Console. I haven't logged in yet. If you don't have an account, actually pretty simple. You just click a try now and you fill out the form. It only asks you your email address and you give a password, your first name, last name, and then click sign up. They don't ask you any payment details because you can use their software for free, but there is a limitation up to a hundred gigabytes. Or if you want to keep a longer, more than 30 days, you need to pay. But if you just keep 30 days is enough, you don't have to pay. So once you click sign up, you will get an email. You just verify that, then you can log in. So I already logged into the web console. It's a very simple, easy to use web UI. You can see the dashboard, which is, uh, uh, I saw someone mentioned that they are using the Valaro, right? Valaro, you don't see this dashboard. So what they also build on top of Valaro is, uh, you don't have to change your existing configurations. You deploy the lightweight agent to your existing Valaro, existing Kubernetes cluster. It will discover all of your Kubernetes, all of your backup configurations, your scheduling. So essentially, if you are existing Valero customer, it allows you to easily to manage. So all of your existing backup configurations, you can keep it as it is. You don't have to migrate. 
it's just providing you some additional feature functionality. You don't have to use the command line to do the restore. They build the UI for Valero, basically. But you don't have to use Valero. If you like Cloud Console itself, you can, it's a standalone. You can do, do the backup as well. Mm. OK, so the first step are logged in. How to connect to the cluster? You just click the configurations cluster. Let me make it bigger. And from here, all you need to do is just click add a cluster. And from here, it will ask you to give a name. Let's say AKS for, I don't know, make it a three. Yeah. And once you click, uh, let me close this one. After you click, uh, you basically give a name, right? And uh, you can give some description. There are some uh, key value you can uh, optionally to, to add the, some key value label. And a click register, it will print you a command. So with this command, so the command basically, it's a YAML file. You run this command from all your terminal. So let me go back to my cloud shell. So let me verify if I got the cluster running correctly. So I got a one node cluster right now. It's running 1.26. Let me check if my namespace is all good. My PostgreSQL also deployed. And if you want to check all the ports, you can verify all the ports also running correct. Let me hide this one. Yeah, it's my PostgreSQL also running okay. Uh, you mentioned the PVC. If you want to verify your PVC, right now I only have one PVC, which is used by a PostgreSQL database. And how to do the backup? And back to the console here, I copy the command. I'm going to run this command here. So after you run this command, basically behind the scene, it just run the create namespace, create a service account, and then create a cluster row binding, create the deployment. There is a new namespace will be created here. It's called Cloud Console Dash IO. If you check the ports, you will see you will see the ports, the light version will be launched. So there is a Cloud Console Cube Agent Manager. Basically, that's the operator. And then the actual agent is called a Cube Agent. So right now it's a pending. Shortly within a few seconds, it will be up running. So once it's up running, if you go back to the dashboard, you will see the cluster is connected. It will be showing active. So right now we are still waiting for the cluster uh, running. Any question about the first, the first step? Basically, you just register your cluster. But it doesn't have to be AKS. If arrow is there, we also do the same thing. We register arrow cluster, and then you can do the, do the same thing. Actually, let me let me register that one as well. So if I'm going to register another cluster, let me click save now. So right now I click save, you can you can filter. Oh no, not the arrow. It's AKS. You can see X it's registered, but it wasn't showing active yet. But in the meantime, if you want to add another cluster, let's say ARO for young three. And the same thing, I do the register and then print a command. This command we're going to run from a different cluster. So I'm going to run from all, from all the arrow cluster. So let me say, you guys can see my screen. Yeah? Let me make it a slightly bigger. So if I run get OC get nodes, you can see uh, how many nodes, uh, probably five, eight nodes cluster, three master nodes. So this is my arrow cluster. The same thing, I run this command from an arrow cluster, and we're going to deploy lightweight agent to the arrow cluster as well. So if I do OC get ports, So you can see we're going to do the same thing, just deploy agents. So right now, what I did is uh, I deploy the Cloud Cars agent to AKS, also deploy Cloud Cars agent to Arrow. So let's let me check the other cluster. Uh, where is my? It's 
it's over here. So from the terminal, you can see right now it's running. So once it's running, if I come in back, you can see my AKS143, it's active. So once it's showing active, you actually, you already connected register your cluster to the cloud. So literally all of your cluster will be listed here. So you have the beauty multi-cluster management. And the beauty here is you don't have to do the upgrade maintenance. It's managed by the, by the cloud provider. And uh, the lightweight agent, a lightweight agent will be automatically do the upgrade for you. So now how to do the backup? So you can you can define a policy basically to define what do you uh how long you want to keep the backup and how often you want to do the backup. But if you don't want to do the policy, you can also do one time backup as well. So go back to the dashboard. What I'm going to show you here is I can define a backup. You can granularly define which cluster you might have dozens or hundreds of different clusters, which cluster you want to back them up. So I select my latest one, AKS. And then next step, do you want to back up the whole cluster or you just want to back up your application? So for me, seriously, I just need to back up my application. If the whole cluster is gone, doesn't matter, I can spin up a new cluster. But if my data is gone, that's the problems. So I just select my application and then click next. And uh, you do have uh, advanced options to have the pre-application hook, which is you can have the application consistency backup. But for now, let me skip this. So you can use your existing policy. Let's say I got an existing policy called EKS, so it doesn't matter. So you just define uh, this policy to say every one hour I do a backup and then I keep 30 days. Or if you don't want to do that, you can choose uh, the one-time job. So basically, you just do a manual back on the job. So for me, uh, let, let me keep this policy. Uh, click next. What do you? Uh, what are you backing up? Let's say my AKS uh, PG PostgreSQL. Do the snapshot. Do the copy. So do the snapshot. The snapshot is still sitting in the cluster. The copy will make another copy to the object storage, which is more safe, more reliable. Click create. So we'll create the backup policy. Make it smaller. Let's see. Yeah, the, the backup policy is here. So in the bottom here, it, this one, it will automatically to schedule to run every hour, but you don't want to wait next schedule job. I just click run now and it give you an on-demand backup job. So once I click on demand or I run now, it will start to run the backups. What do you guys think? So life is a lot easier. Uh, I know you are using the Valaru comparing to this. What do you think? Ah, uh, okay. You, you ask them if it's easy. <laughs> You can choose, uh, basically, you can choose to bring your own storage. You can choose your own AWS, Azure, or Google, or even your on-premises object storage also doable. Yeah, give you the complete flexibility. But by default, since it's a managed offering, it comes with the managed storage. If you don't want to use their storage, you can choose your own region, your own location, yeah. So by default, it's up to you. Let me show you. Under the configuration, you got the storage. And from the storage right now, my default storage where it is. Uh, I was using OBS object storage and that one was from, from where? That one from Alibaba Cloud. But you can choose any one as a default storage. But if you want to use, uh, use the existing managed storage, you also have the options. So if you want to add another storage, basically ask you, do you want to add the storage from our Cloud Casa or from our Valor? So it does provide the functionality for you to manage your Valor easily. So if you choose... No, not, I just use Alibaba as a different cloud provider here. Yeah. But it give you any option, you can choose any other cloud. But the the... 
It's running in the cloud, but not in Alibaba cloud. It's in one of the largest public cloud private. <laughs> but the, normally we don't talk about which cloud, but since it's a pass, uh, platform as a set up. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, in this case, they are, I believe they're running on the AWS. Yeah. And uh, for customer running on AWS, actually, they do have some benefits. If you, if the customer also using AWS, you can create the private link between the cloud provider and your AWS account. So in that case, your even the control data, it's not going to travel via the internet. It's via the private link. But your actual backup data, it's just go by to your direct uh, object storage. It could be AWS region here or AWS region or some other region. Hmm? It's by default, it's encrypted. Yeah. Uh, KMS, I believe it's... it's, it's, it's I actually, I don't know. I need to ask them. Yeah, yeah. If you're interested, I, I, I can ask them. I, I don't know if I I could know. Yeah, I can't remember if I there is a way I can choose the different key. But I, I believe they, they talk about that they can do the KMS integration. If you're using AWS KMS key here. Yeah. So this is an option. You can choose a different uh, uh, object story location. You can choose the other AWS S3, but S3 compatible cover all different uh, object storage or Azure, including uh, Google Cloud Storage. Yeah. So it does give you the flexibility, the options. So where, where we are, let's see if the job are completed successfully. So you can see the job, the snapshot backup job, it's already completed. And it also give you the more visibility. If I click the job details, you can see the progress and how long it take, uh, 18 seconds, we completed the whole backup. And uh, the activity log also give you the more visibility. If you check the PV details, you can see my persistent volume, it's uh, one gigabytes only. And the PV copy, the copy is the moving copy to the object storage. Why it's not copied? Uh, let me see. Or oh, did I? Oh no, it's my mistake. I, I did not choose the the copy. I only choose the snapshot. So that's why there is no copy. If I go into edit the the details, you can see when when I choose the when I choose oh no, it's here. I actually I forgot to choose. I choose. I leave the default snapshot only. If I choose a snapshot and copy, it will create another copy. Okay, which is more reliable. I normally, I, I suggest the customer to always do a snapshot and a copy. The reason is you don't want to, if the, my whole cluster, my data center is gone, you can't recover. But if I have a, another copy sitting somewhere else, it could be far away, it could be in Sydney region, that will be more reliable. And uh, the other thing is I don't want to delete my snapshot immediately after copy. The, the reason is I want to, in case something happens, I can quickly recover from a local rather than always recover from the object storage. So if I update these, when I do the backup job, it will create a snapshot and also make another copy. Yeah, does that make sense? So let me see if the other cluster also added. Yeah, the arrow also active. Okay, so now actually, I need to do another backup because it wasn't copied to the object storage yet. So how to run one-time job? You just click run now and then click run. So we will do the snapshot and then do the copy. So now when it comes to the restore, you basically, there is a restore button here. And you click restore, you can choose any one of the restore points because my first job only only snapshot, so you don't see other restore points. But if you want to do the restore from here, next, and from here, you can choose what do you want to re recover. So I only back up my application. I want to just recover my application. I also give you the flexibility. You can just choose to restore your individual objects. They might just want to re recover uh, config maps 
or maybe endpoints or ports or replica sets rule, it's up to you. So you do have the granularity to recover the individual spec artifacts. Rather than if you recover the everything, so you guys know the, the by default Kubernetes it comes with the ETCD. There is a tool you can back up the whole ETCD, but that back up the whole database. When you do the recover, you basically you recover you override everything. So that's not a good idea. And uh, I I know somebody just deleted the secrets or configure maps. I can pick up uh, this particular objects to the recover. So now click next. I can choose to restore from an existing cluster. You see the arrow here. So basically I can restore from all ACAS. The backup was done from all ACAS. And now I'm going to restore to arrow. Okay. But I need to wait the backup job finish. So let me let me wait. Uh, let me come back to say. Yeah, the job already completed. That's all good. <clears throat> I uh, come back again, click restore. So now I got a three restore points. So any idea why three restore points? The first one only snapshot, the second one snapshot that plus a copy. You see the, the size only 38 megabytes because when I copy to the object storage, there is a deduplication, there is a, a compression. So that's why the size is different than my original PVC size of one gigabyte. So let's say I want to do the restore. I restore my namespace here and then click next. I can choose a different cluster. Uh, by the way, I never tried. I don't know if this one is working or not. If it doesn't work, but at least you get the idea. This is a process. It allows you to choose a different cluster to do the restore. Before I do this restore, I show you another cool stuff. You actually, you can on the fly to create a new cluster. This is very cool. When you want to have a DR cluster, you don't want to keep the DR cluster running. Only when disaster happens, I can spin up a new cluster for you. So right now it only supports the EKS, AKS or GKE. So it doesn't have to be, I back up an AKS, I can only restore to AKS, I can restore to GKE, I can restore to EKS. So I made a suggestion to the company say, I want to be able to restore to Rosa. I want to be able to restore to arrow. Or could be in the future, we can add a, a little bit more icon here. So right now, only the string listed here. So for now, I just want to restore to an existing cluster. And uh, I can choose my uh, arrow cluster here and uh, click next. And uh, part of the restore, you can also choose to do the rename of your namespace. Or you might want to say, I want to give a different namespace when I restore to the target cluster. Or you might want to choose a different storage class. It's very common, either using a managed disk, but for uh, AWS, they are using uh, what's they call it, GP2, GP3, or IO1. So that's a complete different. So it allows you to change to a different storage class. Uh, I'm not going to choose this one for now. Rename namespace. I don't have to rename the namespace, but I actually when I restore to arrow, I do need to transform the storage class. Otherwise it will fail. So when, when I change to a different storage class, let me see. So basically I need to go back to my terminal to see what's the storage class from here I can use. So I was running from Azure actually, it already listed, it already give me the pop-up list. I choose the manage the premium, for example here, I can choose manage the premium. Okay. But if you want to verify my AKS cluster, which is storage class I'm using, but since we, we are running from, a, from a, the same cloud, so you don't have to transform the storage class. But if you are using different storage, different cloud provider, you might need to transform the storage class. 
Okay. So for now, if I leave the default, actually it also works because I'm running in the same cloud, same cloud provider, I can see the same storage class. So it should work. But technically I can choose it to, to a different storage class. So I'm going to click next. I'm going to give a name, let's say PG restore, restore to arrow. And once you've done all of these, you basically, you, you are ready to go. You just click restore. And we will do the restore to the target cluster, uh, which is uh, running from our arrow. I think that's about the process. Uh, yeah, as I say, I'm not 100% sure this restore will be okay. Uh, I never tested it. So any questions? Well, the process is uh, that simple, that's easy. You just do a backup from your source cluster and then you choose your target cluster to do re recover. And you can even choose to recover to, uh, uh, to on the fly to spin up a new cluster. No, it will automatically create. Yeah, and also allow it to rename a new namespace. Uh, no, it's, I don't, unless you choose to override by default. Yeah, yeah, you don't have the option to override. Mm. I think that's all I want to talk about for now. Let me see what else. Yeah, yeah, love demo how, how to do it. I already showed you how to do it. So this is just a diagram to show you how, how it works. I want to explain here. So you can see from the left side. So assuming on the left hand side, you got the AKS here. And on the right hand side, you got the arrow. So we basically we install Cloud Casa to AKS and then we take a snapshot, including your application configuration and the data. And then we make a copy to the object storage. After that, we did the restore. The restore will be restored to the target cluster here. So in this case, it's a ARO cluster. No, that's another beauty. If you're running older version, let's say 1.22, I can restore you directly with 1.26. So that to, to simplify, yeah, you understand the API changes from different versions, it allow you to restore to the new new version. So basically to simplify your upgrade maintenance. I think we, we, are, we are almost there. Just to highlight some uh, why Cloud Casa is so popular, especially for the managed Kubernetes, managed OpenShift. It's so easy, so simple to use. The other thing I haven't touched on about the security skin. Uh, I think uh, the, the guy asked earlier, you want to do the uh, CIS benchmark scan, the configuration, is there any misconfiguration? So the tool also have the built-in security scan capabilities or could be your networking related issues. It, it does allow it. Hmm? Major climb. So right now in APAC, uh, not really yet, but they're American company. Yeah. So their main customers um, potentially from the US region EMEA, not, not from here yet. But this is a great tool, yeah. Hmm. And uh, some reference links, yeah, if you're interested to uh, learn a little bit more. And uh, yeah, that's the one I was planning, yeah, how to, uh, that's the one I was talking to, how to migrate to AKS. Technically, you use the same tool, you can migrate to AKS. Could be from on-premise or other cloud to AKS. Uh, I remember there is a customer from where? It's uh, one of the uh, financial customers. It was uh, uh, provided by one of the GSI from India. Yeah. Hmm. Customer is no, not really a lot. Yeah, the company are actually are pretty new. So the company only like a two years, 
and uh, but it's one of the lead and uh, art performer according to the giga arm the third party to but the market is more even you look at the market you ask people are you doing the backup they, they don't even think about doing the backup yet <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's not it's not common to me correct, correct. Yeah. But, I would change jobs actually. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's common. Yeah. Uh, I can I... So many cloud cards, right? Uh, no. Because some of the installing you did in a target destination source cluster. Right? Yeah. So you have you know, giving away your cluster, right? Powerful operations can open up the whole cluster or you know, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. So from the security standpoint of view, that <coughs> so clients might be willing to connect cars in the environment so that they are sold and target. Yeah, but uh, I tell you what, the, the company is uh, managed as a service. And right now, they don't have the plan and they don't have the option to be self managed. But when, when you're talking about the security, they don't require any inbound access, only outbound access to cloud cars are the, the portal. Just the read of reading, read, read oh. only. Yeah. Now, even your, <clears throat> when you register your account, for example, so what I showed you earlier is I register the cluster, but they also allow you to register the cloud account, AWS, Google, Azure. You can register the cloud account. When you register the cloud account, there is uh, some more advantages. You discover all of your cluster from your cloud account. But the cloud account, the details, it's not saving to the, it's still saving from your cloud, uh, your Kubernetes cluster as a secret, basically. It is, it does require. require. Large security <laughs> so yes. Providing that role. Uh, it's, I, I agree. Yeah, there is. So it depends. What are you looking? If you're looking, I mean, the security in order to be able to access your cloud to read your data to be able to backup, it does require the permissions. Otherwise, you just can't do that. But you can have the granular role based access control to only have the certain permissions and needed the permission to do the backup. You don't have to it's give that. Hmm? You need quite broad permissions. It is. Yeah. 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 It, it does require higher permission to be able to read all these, you know, information. Yeah. And it requires your know, API to be open enough so that Cloudcast is pinpoint can reach it, communicate with it. So there's so a few holes to it. For, uh, for the communication, actually, it's pretty simple. The, as far as I read, is uh, it only requires a cluster to be able to outbound access to IP address by port 443. That's it. It doesn't require any other access. There is no inbound access at all, only outbound access to the cloud so portal. Back to the cloud dashboard to see what for. Oh, no, it's so the agent. It's the agent sitting in your cluster. It will send it. Yes. Back to the yeah. No, the restore happening from your cluster. It just restart. make it just make the uh, make the command you run from your your cluster actually. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think that that's about it. Yeah, let me come back to the, where is my interest slide? So anyone has anything want to announce? So th uh, that's the one I put here is, is the open mic time. Yeah, last time, uh, last time I was here, I'm still looking for a job, but I, I'm so excited. I, I got a new job actually. Yeah, yeah. I just started yesterday. Yeah, I joined the security company. 
It's called Wiz. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Wiz. I'm going to talk about a little bit of Kubernetes security in the future. Yeah. It's one of the good companies yeah, focusing on the security. Hmm. Anyone else want to share anything? Or you might know anyone is looking for a job or you are hiring. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to let us know. Uh, only, did, did you see the, we do have a link. So basically speaker, you yeah. fill out the form or you just let, let, let me know. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure you guys are doing Kubernetes. The same thing in Singapore. When I initially started, basically I similar like here. I do a lot of talking, but later I complete. I don't do anything. The guys are running. I got to the volunteers. Yeah, because I've, I've done all my Kubernetes are thinking about security. So, you know, like I gave a talk about um, building like secure Kubernetes workloads. So, I just talked about like code scanning, packet scanning. Um, oh, that's so pretty cool. Nullify, which is like a security tool that hopefully developers don't need. So, I'd love to talk to um, anyone about kind of how you're thinking about secure development and scanning. Yeah. Where do you guys work? Nullify. Oh, nice. Yeah, we'd love to. Mm -hmm. I know there's like a container security meetup, but yeah. Well, no, it's cool. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. So we do, we do looking for actually more than just one. We do need more speakers, more volunteers, more sponsors. <laughs> 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 that's so good anyone else want to volunteer want to be speaker or want to sponsor us yeah feel free to join us as any one of the options volunteers we, we do need more volunteers we do need more speakers more sponsors so the email you can send right? Yes, yes. I, I can send you guys the link. Or if you guys want to, yeah, just just let me know. Connect me by LinkedIn or Twitter. Yeah. Hmm. If you guys don't have anything else, if you guys don't mind, or... uh -huh. we. Oh, uh, okay. What's that made up? What's that one? Okay. We actually, we did not pick up any particular day. I just looking for which day is Red Hat is available to provide me the place. So for, for, January, for June next month, I haven't looked into a place yet. So if you guys know anywhere, any company can. Oh, well, okay. Okay. Well, that, that should be easy, right? <laughs> yeah, come to you, yeah. Where it is? Oh, Richmond. Man. Richmond also, not, not far, yeah. It can be easy to access by, by chain, right? Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. So you work for SUSE or are you work for Launch uh, SUSE? I'm, I'm just wearing Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's very important. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to grab your details. Definitely, yeah, I'm actually need definitely the, the number one. Oh, okay, okay. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, I hope it is useful to you guys. I need you guys to come come here to, to share what you love. Not just me and the Paul is talking. <laughs> okay, if you know other questions, yeah. If you guys don't mind, yeah, let's take us take a group of photo. Are you guys all good?
Yeah, can we just meet up uh, over there? Let, let's take a group photo. Yeah. Wow. Oh, 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 yeah.